Birmingham, just to set it in context for those who don't know it, Birmingham is the UK's second city. It has a population of nearly 1.2 million. Of that population, approximately 42% is from ethnic minorities, and 43% of children in the schools have English as a second language. It is a hugely diverse cultural city, and that diversity, I have to say, is one of its strengths. There are, in total, 437 schools in Birmingham, and approximately 50 independent schools uh, of one description or another. In 2014, the middle of 2014, an anonymous letter was received by the city council leader setting out in the letter an alleged plan by a group of indivi individuals to infiltrate a number of schools with governors, principals and teachers who would work together to change the character and organization of education in those particular schools. The letter itself led to an independent investigation, first of all on behalf of Birmingham, but quite quickly a second investigation was ordered by the then Secretary of State. And that gave rise to a report known as the Clark Report. Peter Clark produced a very detailed and lengthy report, and that's it, and it's fairly lengthy. The Clark Report, in fact, identified that a number of the practices, if I'd call them that, referred to in the letter, were indeed being followed in a number of schools and had been followed in a number of schools. Not all of them in every school, but some of them in the group of schools. That conclusion was supported by independent inspection by Ofsted of, a, of 21 schools. So in effect, out of 437, first of all, if we get the scale of things, there were 21 schools identified as somehow or other being part of this uh, process. What was, what, were they, what was Clark referring to and Ofsted referring to? I can't go through them all, time won't permit. But for example, in those schools, girls were separated from boys in the same room. Girls were at the side or at the back. The boys were at the front, and the teaching was directed towards the boys. A number of aspects of the curriculum were not being taught. Music was being removed from the curriculum, as were other subjects and other work. Restrictions were placed on which sports activities were available to boys and girls. Music was certainly removed from a lot of the schools. And any member of staff, including the principal, who disagreed with these practices were targeted, and there's plenty of evidence to support that from the individuals concerned, that a number of them were bullied, bullied and harassed until ultimately they resigned. The result of Clark's report was that, in his view, some of these activities in schools left young people in danger of exposure to extremist views. As there were groups of people of influence in the school who espoused, endorsed, or failed to challenge those extremist views. Can I stress it was extremism, risk of. It was not a statement that they had become extreme, nor that they had been radicalized. It was simply that there was a potential exposure to that. Important to understand these schools were not faith schools. And so the practices that were being observed and reported by young people and teachers were contrary to a number of laws within the United Kingdom. And of course, possible exposure to extremist views was contrary to the government's counter-terrorism strategy anyway. But I do re refer back, this is 21 schools out of a total of 437. And it was against that background, very briefly, uh, outline that I was appointed in October 2014 as Education Commissioner for Birmingham to oversee and approve a plan to change what was then had been happening in schools and to see a general improvement in the way that the authority, Birmingham City Council, worked. This plan eventually had 12 strands of work. 
with the major priorities initially given to improving safeguarding. And safeguarding in, our, in the UK's term is about protecting children from any harm and any undue influence, whether it is uh, neglect at home, whether it is, whether it is grooming of, y of young girls or whatever, but to protect them from that. So we had attention on safeguarding. We also needed to strengthen governance in schools. And we also needed to get into Birmingham a system of school improvement which enabled the authority to know what was happening in its schools. The problem that we were seen in 2014 was not a sudden development. It had a history, probably a best part of a decade before it became public in, in the way that it did. Further priorities uh, of significance, one theme was that of community cohesion. If we solved the situation in schools but didn't solve the whole issue of community cohesion, then we hadn't got to the root of the challenge facing us. So that was quite important to do that. But clearly changing attitudes is a long-term process. One of the first actions that was taken in the summer and latter part of 2014 was to enable the removal from the schools of any principals, teachers, and governors identified as having been part of the actions that were described. They were either, they either stood down of their own volition or were suspended. There is, of course, in, in, uh, in England, an established procedure for suspending teachers and principals prior to a full hearing of the case, and, of course, even at the conclusion of that case, whatever its conclusion, they still have the right to uh, uh, have their case reheard in that sense. In the case of governors, at the time, there was not an established procedure for barring governors from being governors of a school. And therefore, a relatively new procedure had to be quickly put in place. Today, some of those individuals have been banned from teaching or governorship. But as I say, they all have the right of appeal. While other cases continue to be heard, I don't imagine that the totality of those cases will be completed probably until the end of this year at the earliest. And of course, it's right that that process should be both thorough from everybody's perspective and fair uh, and objective and had to confirm, obviously, to all aspects of current legislation. One of the first things that that led to was a change to the definition of safeguarding. Up to that point, safeguarding had really concerned what I think most people recognize, neglected children, potential uh, self-harm, so on and so on, including, of course, uh, grooming. But the government decided it now needed to add a further dimension, and that was the potential exposure to extremist views. So safeguarding was broadened in its definition. And that was in the uh, material, it's defined to include any form of extremism. Can I stress here that there are different, there are a whole range of extremists operating from the extreme right to the extreme left. We've seen it in the UK, for example, extremism in one form in the Northern Ireland. This particular form of extremism was therefore not isolated from the generality of things. Clearly, I don't have the time to go into substantial details of actually what's been done. So I've selected a number to give you a flavor for what we've had to do in Birmingham and I've had to oversee. All teaching staff and governors were required to undergo training in relation to the revised description of safeguarding. Each school was then expected to produce a new amended policy and to ensure that all staff understood their responsibilities within that, and that included uh, governors. And of course, in all the schools, one senior member staff had the lead in this matter in, in all schools, not just in Birmingham, but more generally. All governing bodies had to undertake training to strengthen the governance in the schools and to understand fully their responsibilities. In some cases, governors decided that this was not what they wanted to do and left the governing body, and therefore the governing body had to be refreshed with new people. A new body was, was established in Birmingham, which uh, 
how it goes by the acronym of MASH, multi-academy uh, safety hub, self safeguarding hub. And that was a point at which schools could refer cases across the whole of the safeguarding arena. It's common around the country as a whole. It's nothing new uh, as far as Birmingham is concerned. But that was uh, newly set up in 2014 as well. The inspection body Ofsted has been taking safeguarding and giving it much greater attention in inspections. And there are instances where schools have actually been put in either requires improvement or inadequate category because safeguarding is not considered sufficiently uh, uh, strong in the school. And the city council had to produce an entirely new whistleblowing policy. A policy which not only had a clear line where people could say, anonymously or otherwise, I'm bothered about X or I'm bothered about Y, that actually respected and made clear that their complaint would be acted upon and taken seriously and that as whistleblowers, their anonymity, anonymity, their, 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 the fact they're anonymous, that would be recognized and, and, and so on. And they would, while it was being investigated, have full support from the local authority uh, during that time. We had also to see that an improved system of collection of all information about schools was established in Birmingham with such a, 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 a system which has hard information as well as soft information as well, that then you're in a position to identify any issues before they become serious or any trends. It may surprise you that at that point in time, Birmingham did not have such a database. The government, uh, more latterly, has insisted that all schools must teach British values. However, they choose to do it through the curriculum. It's not a subject and it's right, it's, it's all through the curriculum and indeed through work that sits outside the curriculum through uh, uh, enhanced uh, cur curriculum, extracurricular activities. And the, the British values have been defined as democracy, rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. We have now got in Birmingham a new body established outside of the council to be responsible for school improvement and monitoring what schools are doing. It is run by schools for schools. And in many cases, the school improvement and monitoring is undertaken by those people from Birmingham schools with some outside help on occasions, but particularly from those uh, uh, principals and teachers who are regarded and known to be outstanding practitioners. There's been close attention given also to identifying what are in the UK is defined as unregistered independent schools. Schools which are operating with children but have not registered with the de department as a, an independent school. There are a number of them around the country and indeed in Birmingham during the last three months four such schools have been closed. From those early priorities we moved on to other matters like community cohesion. Equally, apart from what is happening in schools, there's been a requirement that the council changes the way it operates, both at the political and administrative levels. A separate report, the Kerslake report, identified the weaknesses in the operation of Birmingham City Council. What are the outcomes today? Well, we continue, we continue to uh, follow and monitor the impact of much of this work. To date, without a doubt, I can say to you, safeguarding and governance have clearly been strengthened, along with the various policies and practice. These are now well embedded in our schools and leading indeed to some very good practice. Young people are undoubtedly now safer from whatever form of threat that they might come to. Governance has also been strengthened, and there is ample evidence to, to indicate improvement. The whistleblowing policy and practice is also working well and complaints are being invested quickly and fully with the individual where they wish to be known, very much protected and supported. I think it's fair to say that I cannot see at this point in time a chance of a repeat of 2014, but that doesn't mean to say we haven't got to be vigilant and it doesn't mean to say that there isn't yet uh, more to do. What a lot of this has done is indicate where the government needs to look at changes to policy and regulations. 
unregistered schools are the first body that they have issued new guidance about how they wish to deal with them. We have a, now a procedure for barring governors. That is now in place, but wasn't previously. The process for the appointment of governors has been strengthened, where anyone nominated for such a post has to go through due diligence. And in Birmingham, where the local authority actually nominates governors, then they have put a restriction on the individuals not being able to be governor of more than two schools. Two schools are maximum, and they are limiting the term that, uh, that they can operate, which is a little bit of a contentious issue. The moment they've got two, three-year spans, and there are individuals long, long standing who say, well, I've been doing it longer than that, and I want to continue to do it, and probably are doing a good job. So there's a discussion debate to be had there. In conclusion, before I leave it, open it up to you, the events in Birmingham were, in our sense, unprecedented, but not necessarily impossible to happen elsewhere. A great deal of progress has been made in Birmingham, but more, obviously, is yet to be completed. I should say there is a very high proportion of outstanding and good schools in Birmingham, and if you look to the aggregate performance of schools in Birmingham, they're above the national average. There are many outstanding individuals from many of these highly effective schools, and they have played a significant part in bringing about the changes outlined here. And on this public platform, at least, I think they deserve an enormous thanks from me for the work that they have contributed to date and for their commitment to continue to restore the reputation of Birmingham and its schools. I've no doubt that in due course that will be the case. Uh, and that what we saw in 2014 will become a matter of history, uh, and that's where it should be. Those of you, if you're from the UK, can I tell you that the term that was originally used about the letter is not official use now. It has disappeared as a term. We refer more broadly to schools that are vulnerable rather than the, the phrase. If, if anyone wants privately to know what the term was, I'll, I'll tell you, but uh, I'm not going to say it because... I was the one who got it to be stopped. It wasn't helpful to the schools. It wasn't helpful to the, to the city and its schools. So it's not used anymore. That's me. I'm sorry I've gone slightly over, but it's over to you. You can ask questions or make statements or, uh, if you wish. I knew the press would want to get in early. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want a mic? Are the, are the mics about? Can you, if you can shout enough, go on. I wouldn't, no, it won't, no. no it's, my brief covers all schools in Birmingham, whatever their designation, um, and it's a role between the schools and the interface with the local authority and the local authority. So it, it covers that. It's a, it, it's a bit of a, an exercise in tiptoeing around but occasionally one, uh, you know, one has to be firm and say this needs to be done or this needs attention. No, I, ju I, think, I think that first of all, some of the schools that were first of all caught up in that, it was ultimately proven they weren't involved at all. Secondly, without a doubt, that term was beginning to have an adverse impact upon the morale of teachers in Birmingham and equally a, uh, an impact upon the recruitment of people to Birmingham, not just to the schools but to the authority itself. And I, I go back to the point, it was 21 schools out of 437. <laughs> so I think one has to be quite careful about that term. It, it wasn't at the time. At the time, I know why it was used, but gradually it became, it became more of a problem uh, 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 rather than part of the solution. So it went. So if I'm you know, as careful as I try to be, I will never use the term. <laughs> Anyone else? Is it? Uh, hi, I'm from one of the UK media as well, which, I which was also reporting it as, as you said, it was being reported. Uh, but if you were to give your thoughts as to why Birmingham, why it kind of came up in the first place in Birmingham, and uh, B, did you, did you face much resistance when all these changes were being put in place? Uh, I, I think that... In, certainly in terms of England, that's all I can speak about. I, I'm not going to refer to Scotland, Ireland, uh, or Northern Ireland or Wales. But in England, um, I think the, 
the difference was the size of Birmingham and the fact that it was the first case to be come to public knowledge. It doesn't mean to say that it couldn't happen in other cities in England or that it might have but not become public. So it was really, the issue in Birmingham was, it became a public matter. It became a public matter. As I said, I think that uh, it probably had its history well before 2014. Well before 2014. Uh, so it's impossible to, to be precise when it, when it did start. But what was clear from the Clark report was that the local authority prior to 2014 had information which if they'd have collated, they'd have seen what was happening and been able to intervene earlier. But they didn't. In terms of uh, opposition, no. Parents I've met in schools, even those schools that were affected, they start from one principle that every parent does. I want a good education of my son and my daughter. I aspire for my son and my daughter to achieve as highly as possible. So the answer is no. I have, we haven't met any opposition to that principle. That's all I want for every child. And the question is really, can we get to that point? Well, yes, we can. So no, not in schools, not amongst parents, not amongst governors uh, at all. Uh, they're very, very supportive and working very hard, uh, in a sense, to get past what happened uh, in 2014. And I, as I ended with, that is being achieved by the teachers, principals, governors, and others in Birmingham who, uh, who are working very hard uh, to, to put in the past this particular episode. Any other? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that there was any suggestion of a, an organizing hand or that there was coordination beyond individual clusters of people operating? Because if there are letters of which are very similar in other parts of the country, it would suggest some sort of element of coordination. Well, there, there, there have been claims, and I, I can say no stronger than that. There have been claims that, that um, similar, similar uh, actions were, were being discussed in other parts of the country. What is clear in Birmingham is that there were a small group of people, small group of people, of governors, of teachers, of principals, who were intimately involved with each other and acting in concert. Uh, whether or not uh, that, that body of people were then putting their propositions elsewhere, I, there is, there, I don't know. There is certainly anecdotal evidence that that was the case. But I don't, I, I don't know that for a fact, so I wouldn't want it to be reported as a fact. It's simply that that uh, anecdotally has come from, I'm sure it's come to the press as it's come to other people. What was certainly the case in Birmingham was it was a very small group of people who had a plan and implemented that plan over a period of time, gradually uh, and subtly in some cases, until it became such a matter that Obviously, it broke into the public, uh, public mind. There are, there are all sorts of discussions, as you know, about whether that letter was uh, real or imaginary, uh, whether it was true or not. All I can say is that letter was real. It was anonymous, but a lot of the things that it said were happening were found to be happening. Not, every, not everyone, but a substantial majority of them. Any other... Uh, We've got four minutes. You've still got four minutes if you want to. Yeah. Well, it depends what you mean by the same sort of thing. If you mean, if you take the broader view that are there other cities in which, or other parts of cities in which young people may be exposed to extremist views, those extremist views can come from a wide range. For example, I know schools were bothered about some extreme right-wing groups uh, that, have, that have no faith connection whatsoever. So it isn't a case of saying there's only one form of extremism. So yes, there could be. I don't know of any. Certainly none have become in the public domain. The nearest that you've got any public information is the inspections carried out by Ofsted of schools in Tower Hamlets. That's the nearest you've got. Again, which identified, and I do stress, exp 
potential exposure to, there was no question that any young person through what was happening had been radicalized at all. I want that to be absolutely understood, none whatsoever. And Peter Clark's report is very, very clear about that. So it was exposure to, rather than... Uh, and I, I, talking to a lot of young people in the schools concerned, a lot outside, they, they, they are very, very incredibly ambitious for themselves, both boys and girls. Parents are ambitious for them. And they go back, what they wanted was a good education. They didn't want all of what was happening around them. And that has undoubtedly disrupted the education and possible achievement of a number of young people coming into this year's examinations. Sadly. Very sadly. Hmm. Well, what, what I think what we what we found in Birmingham is, is beginning to be discussed as part of the policy about how we go forward with governing bodies. Not just of maintain schools, but indeed of academies as well. Uh, and the extent to which uh, within those governing bodies there is, first of all, some sensible check uh, on, on people coming forward, due diligence. You do it if you're appointing members of staff. Uh, and secondly, that before they can take up their post, they really should undergo the training. They've got to do the prevent training, which is part of the government policy, but also they ought to undergo the safeguarding. I mean, strictly speaking, the governing body is responsible for the policy of safeguarding and should actually have it re indicate formally that they've read it and understand their responsibilities. So there are changes like that uh, uh, that have occurred and, and are spreading gradually. It's a big job. Retraining the governing bodies of 437 schools is no mean feat. Uh, equally, getting them all on to safe. Just about, we've, we've just about got it done in the, in the approximately two years, uh, or two years this autumn. So, in, in actual fact, they, they, they've done very, very well. But it's, again, strength. It's a, I think the key to avoiding it is that intelligence is collected and compiled centrally within an authority, whereas before it was... Some bit was deposited there, a bit was deposited there, and nobody brought it together. If it's brought together, then you can spot the potential, potential problems or potential trends. But I think we... I've argued, I've lost, by the way, but I've argued that it's about time that we had a proper review of governments in our schools. It's 1970-odd since we had the last full-scale review of government, and in that time, governors have been given enormous responsibilities within law uh, as well. And I think it's a time to, to have, have a fresh look at that. All unpaid. All unpaid. Yes. Um, well, I think the way that I'm seeing it happen in Birmingham is that the schools are, first of all, w if they see something like that, they're not, referring, they're not referring it to the utmost level before they've investigated, actually, uh, and taken sensible soundies. And, and the people in our schools, we've, we, they're professionals. They know these children. They know the families. There is every reason to suppose that if that's done, then, then you avoid what I would call going to the nuclear option. Uh, so I think the first stage is to say to schools, if you have worries, and I know a lot of schools who do, they'll have two, three, one, two, three, whatever number of young people, who they're keeping an eye on because they're concerned about either what they've said or what they've drawn or whatever, or in some cases, uh, uh, the, the family history. But if you escalate it straight, for, straight away, you get the situation you've got in the newspaper. And I, I regret that greatly because it does damage to the, the, the child, there's damage to the family, and it uh, Im immediately causes community tensions which are not helpful. So I would say you've got to be very careful about how you escalate uh, that uh, process. And that's the w that depends upon the way in which the school and the authority and its safeguarding board operate. And th th <coughs> those are key players in that, uh, in that matter. You should be able to avoid that if you behave uh, more, more sensibly and logically than it appears to have been the case. Um, uh, how, can, how can schools kind of monitor what might be going on outside of their gates um, and in terms of, yeah, policing that when it might be happening outside the classroom? Yes, uh, there, you cannot. I mean, let's be clear. There is no way in which you can uh, 
easily uh, and simply find out what you know, find out everything that anyone is doing. But the the uh, information that comes centrally now is not just from schools, but is also from the police and the health service as well, uh, and so on. So there's a, there's a combining of, it, of intelligence insofar as it's known. You know, if I don't want to quote a former vice president of America, but it's the unknowns, you know, the story. That, but the, you'll never have a hundred percent picture of, of what is happening, um, and and all you can do is use, and that's why. Whatever information you've got, you shouldn't escalate it too quickly until you've done some sensible investigation at the school level with the family to see just what, what is happening. Um, and and what, what advice would you give to uh, places that are having much more sporadic examples of radicalisation? Like in Australia, we, we, don't, we haven't had nearly had quite had the situation that we had in Birmingham, but still there are very concerning um, signs mm. around um, young teenagers being radicalised. What advice would you give somewhere like that? For, for me, I mean, the first, I think the, my advice would be if the young person was in school, then the first place is, what is can we not find out, what it, can the school not identify changes in behaviours? In other words, they're, they're not become radicalised, but they're under, they're, they're under threat of becoming so. The question then is, what are the indicators that would point to you asking questions and doing further investigation? We have a number of those number of those factors certainly within uh, England that we that are used for example you know cha changes to behavior becoming more uh, more lone alone than part of, of a group uh, beginning to dress slightly differently beginning to do and you you look at those indicators no different I mean yeah, I know it's Australia but in the UK what I would think no different from looking at a school and saying, is this school in danger of going downhill or not and you can develop a series of indicators like that. They're not absolute and they're not perfect. But I think the question is, can we, can we get to young people when, the, when they're being exposed to extremist views and prevent it from going any further in the interests of the individual young person as well as uh, the family and the community? There's no perfect answer. If you're looking for the absolute perfect answer, there isn't one. Uh, I'm sure there's an Australian answer which we'd love to know and share and uh, see what we can learn from you. Anything, anyone else? No? Well, I think, my, I think looking at that clock, my time has run out. Uh, can I thank you all for uh, giving your time this afternoon? Uh, I hope you found it of interest. It's obviously more of interest to people in the UK possibly than it is to others, but thank you very much indeed for your attendance and your contributions. Thank you. <laughs>